Hello and welcome back to my office. Today I'm giving an extra little video and the reason is that I've had some questions from Omar where he's asked about the books I've been using for research. Excuse me, I need to read my screen here. Uh, research into the Bloody Mary series. He says, I'm fascinated by that period of history and while doing your research for that series, what books did you p find particularly helpful? Uh, he's mentioned that he's really interested in William Cecil and Francis Walsingham. Well, I was thinking about this and I went through a whole bunch of my books which are up here on my shelves. And the very first ones that were useful were these two. This is The England of Elizabeth I, which was published by the Reprint Society of London, and it was by A.L. Rouse, who I think was... A professor at Oxford or Cambridge at the time. First published 1950 by Macmillan Press and this book, oh it's lovely, has no price in it. I think I paid 50p for it at the local dump and I paid 50p for it purely because I like hardback books. I collect them when I can and when I see them at the dump and they're going to get trashed if they're not bought by someone, I find it hard to refuse. So I bought this there and it's a really good general overview of Elizabeth and her period. Now, I've got a load of books up here that some of them could be interesting, some of them might be useful. So for example, this is the English Reformation and it's from a series called A Brief History Of. So there's a number of these books. This one's by Derek Wilson, and it's published by Constable and Robinson, still in print now, I think. Again, useful as an overview, just to give you some insights into what would be worthwhile having a look at. David Lodes has written lots of books about Henry VIII and the Tudors generally. So I've got a number of his books. The one, the one on Mary, pretty good. One on Henry, pretty good. Would I go overboard about him? No, I wouldn't. He has a really broad spread of knowledge and understanding about the Tudor reigns, but... Basically, he, I, I don't know how to describe his books. They just don't really grab me as titles, if you know what I mean. The, the difficulty is you so often find really good books about people in history. So we have this book on Francis Walsingham, for example, Elizabeth's Spy Master by Robert Hutchinson. Now, I bought this because I was starting with the Bloody Mary series. This is published by Phoenix, incidentally. And I saw this, thought, well, that looks as though it's probably going to be a worthwhile read. Actually, it's a very difficult read. It's not a book I would recommend. This one, Francis Walsingham, A Courtier in the, Re in the Age of Terror, by Derek Wilson, on the other hand, I found much more readable. Um, it's, a, it's an easier book to absorb, which gives perhaps a little less information. I mean, this one by Robert Hutchinson is quite small print. I don't know if you can see that. Whereas this is larger print, so there's probably less information in here, but 
it's I, I just found it much much easier to read and if a book's easier to read you're more likely to read it therefore even if it's got less information in it you're more likely to get the information you want this one I have to admit, I haven't actually read yet but it's all about Thomas Cromwell and although Thomas Cromwell was before my time I've got a number of books on him because he was one of those characters that helped Henry VIII. If you find a book that's worthwhile about these characters, then you'll probably find that a lot of things that they were doing and which inspired them will bleed into the age of the next Edward, then Mary and then Elizabeth because they were kings and queens in sh such a short space of time that if you find a good book about the sort of spying that was going on, if you find a book about the culture, the way of life, everything else about them, you're probably going to find that they're going to be useful. Even if you buy a book that's ten years before Elizabeth's reign, it's probably still going to be worthwhile reading it. I should say that um, I always envisage that the Bloody Mary series was going to be leading into Elizabeth the first reign because what I wanted to do with that was set up Jack Blackjack as a miraculously fortunate assassin sort of who was perceived by Elizabeth to be even more effective than his master John Blunt did so I'm hoping that by the time it gets into Elizabeth's reign John Blunt's going to start realizing that Blackjack actually isn't quite as good as he everyone else believes including him he himself had believed, um, and yet he can't get rid of him because Elizabeth thinks that he's really a rather magnificent supporter. Another book by David Lodes was this, which is about the Seymours, um, the famous family who owned Wolf Hall. Actually, I found that particularly useless, sadly. It was no good at all because it was all about the Seymours going back to the early medieval period where they came from and so on and had absolutely bugger all to do with Elizabeth and so on. So those books are all good background. Great. <clears throat> the books that I've really found very useful are books more like... Let's start with this one. Another book I got from the dump. Always useful to show the front of a book when there's nothing on it, isn't it? This is called Palaces and Progresses of Elizabeth I by Dunlop. It used to be a library book because it's got the library, library mark there. I don't know if that means that it was stolen from a library and never got returned. I think quite possibly could have done actually because the front page has just been ripped out where it would have had the library uh, information stamps to show how often it had been taken out. But there's no price marked in. Usually if it's an old library book you'd expect to find a price in pencil written on one of the first pages. There's nothing on this so I assume this was a library book that was stolen. Bournemouth Public Library's Central Lending Library it says. Ah, well, there you go. This is Palaces and Progresses of Elizabeth I, <clears throat> published by Jonathan Cape, and this is a brilliant little book because it has lots of pictures and diagrams. It is not huge uh, in terms of information, but it gives you diagram floor plans of some of the different palaces and places that Elizabeth visited and that means you get a flavour for what the type of building was. It gives you a flavour for the sort of location, it gives descriptions in a lot of these things about what it looked like going up to the palace so you get an idea of the landscape around there. I would just say <coughs> if you're looking at
Now, if you're looking at territory, landscape and so on, you really need to buy a copy or get hold of a copy of this book. A Survey of London, written in the year 1598 by John Stowe. Uh, he was a chap who uh, gave a complete detailed description of the city of London and its suburbs. He wrote it in 15, or it was first published in 1598. Uh, he was born in 1525, so John Stowe lived through the reigns of Henry VIII, Edward VI, Elizabeth I, Mary obviously, and then James I as well. So he saw an awful lot. He was a tailor by occupation, took an active interest in the life and times of his city, which grew very rapidly during his lifetime. Main thing about this book is <coughs> it talks about every different part, so Farringdon Ward, or with. Um, Farringdon Ward Infra, or within. On the south side of the Aldersgate Ward lieth Farringdon Ward, called Infra, or within, for a difference from another ward of that name which lieth without the walls of the city, which is therefore called Farringdon Extra. So it gives you an idea about the landscape, basically. <coughs> but in this, he talks about the buildings in each location, he talks about the history of the parish, he talks about the parish itself extensively, really fascinating and it gives you a lot of information that you can turn to straight away when you're writing. Another book that is quite useful, I wouldn't go overboard, but London's Markets. Books like this that give you a bit of the history of the different markets of the of the city, whether it's Smithfield or um, Lloyd's Market, Lloyd's Register of Shipping and so on, can be very very useful. Another book I would recommend, because it again goes into the territory, is The Lost Rivers of London. This was written by Norman, uh, sorry, Nicholas Barton. Um, I remember being told about this. Yeah, first published 1962 by Leicester University, I think. Um, but it's a fascinating book, because the trouble is London is a great sprawling mass of buildings now. You can walk up Fleet Street you don't necessarily realise you're crossing the Fleet River when you walk across it because it's all been built over. <coughs> you can walk up Walbrook without realising you're crossing the Walbrook River. Um, London itself is really built on top of an awful lot of water. This book tells you where that water is and gives you a chance of going and seeing maps which show you where the rivers would have been. So if you're interested in Tudor England, that's one of the essential things. If you're talking about <coughs> the reign of Elizabeth and leading up to it, so the reign of Mary and so on, the most readable best book I've got is this one, Elizabeth. It's all about her younger years, mostly before she got uh, promoted to Queen, or whatever you call it. Um, but David Starkey, very famous acerbic historian at Oxford, he's a fantastic writer. He is sharp-witted, sharp-tongued, he's, he's vicious, but this is an enormously, enormously readable book. You can't put it down. Very, very interesting. Her life was interesting, but the way that Starkey portrays it is just superb. So I can thoroughly recommend that. It also gives you a good feel for the times, for the people, etc. <coughs> <coughs> I apologise, I am getting over a cold. Now, the next things are what was London really like? And I've got a series of books here. I can't show you all of them, I've got too many. But The Elizabethan Underworld by a chap called Gamini Salgado. You can see that. This is or was published by Sutton Publishing, a firm that's now sadly disappeared. But you should still be able to find copies. I think it's going to be available from other publishers. It was first published in 77 by J.M. Denton Sons. And this is a book that gives you 
a complete view of the underworld. So it gives you an idea about London itself. First of all, then it's got the suburbs of sin, so it's going into prostitution, the fun of the fair, which is all the corruption that went on around there, white magic, black witches, astrologers and alchemists, low life on the highway, highway robberies and so on. <coughs> And then all the information about print, uh, the prisons and all sorts of things. Fascinating book. I find books like this always, always give me plots. Always. A quick glance through this and I've got a number of different plots immediately. Another one that's really useful, London Lives. You can find lots of books like this. This is by Tim Hitchcock and Robert Shoemaker. And it's Poverty, Crime and the Making of a Modern City from 1690 to 1800. So it's a bit after my period, but not so far after my period that a lot of it isn't going to be relevant still. But of course, if you want to be into the Renaissance, then books like this, Everyday Life in Tudor London. This is written by Stephen Porter, who's an expert. And you can tell how important this is by the number of little markers I've got. Each of these is a little book dart, so I just press on that and the book opens at the relevant passage immediately. Really, really useful things, bookmarks. But this book has got so many details about individuals. It's got details about occupations, about the fact that there were cars which were not carts, they were shorter versions of carts that could negotiate London's alleys and lanes. Never heard about them before I read this book, but it's fully documented and detailed. Gives you so many little glimpses into how life was. Rather like this book by the terrible Ruth Goodman, How to Behave Badly in Renaissance Britain. This book is the one I turn to when I want to figure out new swear words and new ways of behaving badly. And then before they go into one of my novels, I have to tone them down because they were pretty disgusting people. Let's just say, if you ever read this book, avoid the bit about the shirt tails. Not nice. I have got other books too. I have The Newgate Calendar. Now The Newgate Calendar is a list of all of the more notable, interesting hangings and executions that happen to people who were kept at Newgate. So it's all those people, the highwaymen, the notable murderers who were taken from Newgate to go down to be executed at Tyburn's Tree. Lovely book. Bit upsetting really, but um, yeah. And that really is the problem. I could keep on talking for quite some time. I've got another book on the underworld here. There's a book here, Con Men and Cut Purses, by Lucy Moore. There's a book, City of Sin, by Catherine Arnold. That's a good book, I like that one. There are a huge number of books here. Treason, that was a good book. Shakespeare's London, Shakespeare's Military Language, The Fighting Tudors. And you will find... There are thousands and thousands of books out there. Now, I've given you a brief glimpse of some of the ones that I've found most useful. But I've raised them because they're most useful because they were all of them, either on my desk or immediately to hand. There are other books, such as this, Dissing Elizabeth. <clears throat> this involves negative rep representations of Gloriana, and it's edited by Julia M. Walker. <clears throat> this is useful, it has some very informative sections, but it's not entirely helpful if you're trying to write a novel. I, I found one chapter of this was useful, for example, with a recent book. The trouble is, it's published by Duke University Press in Durham, North Carolina, but it's a series of... Uh, what would I say... It, very academic papers about Elizabeth. So they are not easily readable. I believe they may well have been selected with 
a particular view in mind, let's say, because I think, let's have a look. The Introductions by Julia, History and Policy by Sheila, Susan wrote about marriage, um, Carol wrote about Merry World. The vast proportion of all the people in this are females. Nothing wrong with that, don't get me wrong. I am a bit of a feminist because I'm terrified of my wife and I've got a very, very strongly willed daughter as well. But you should not be putting feminism into, for example, the age of Elizabeth because you're misrepresenting history. Now, if you're starting to take everything from a feminine perspective, it's the same as reading books that are written from a Marxist historical perspective. You're twisting things. And I find that a lot of these are written either by strongly academic uh, people who are therefore not the easiest reading people there are, or it's a bit distorted and twisted to one particular frame of mind, which is fine, you can read this, but you need to read it with something else that takes a different perspective so that you get more of a balanced viewpoint, in my opinion. So there are lots of collections of academic papers like that, which you'll see advertised. It is worthwhile getting a selection of them. Um, personally, I always have to wait till they get onto the remainder academic websites because that way I can pick them up at a moderately reasonable price because I can't realistically academic books come out they cost 30 to 50 quid and um, I can't afford 50 pounds for a novel uh, for a book of any sort um, it's just outside of my price league but um, if you can get them from remaindered sites which you often can because they normally have very small print runs and even they don't sell um, universities now are focused so much on publishing new books. The actual number of sales they're not bothered about, it's actually just the number of titles that's coming out from their researches. So there's a lot of new books published which never get sold, so they always go straight into the remainder piles, and then you can pick them up from specialist bookshops like Postscript Books, which are, which are on the internet postscript.co.uk, they normally have books that are reduced from £35 down to 6 Well, it makes sense. I can afford to buy those books. It's, it's cheaper than going to the British Library. <laughs> so, look around, make a selection of the different types of book you want, is my advice. Um, do go for <clears throat> the odd popular writer. Have a look at them and see what you think of them, but someone like Ruth Goodman is very, very good. I've got books on swearing through the centuries and all sorts, and they can be fascinatingly useful. <coughs> There's also other types of book. Um, this is not directly relevant. This is about um, Sir Francis Henry Drake, not Francis Drake from Queen Elizabeth, but... Henry Francis Henry who was 1723 and it's a series of his letters but this isn't something you see generally widely available it's published by the Boydell Press in fact this one but it's published for the Devon and Cornwall Record Society it's worthwhile if you're interested in a particular area always to see if there's a local um, archaeological or record society there that you might be able to find, it's another place you may find a lot of very interesting books. So I, I hope that's of use, Omar. Um, I think the books that I've found most hugely helpful, when you're talking about Walsingham and Cromwell, possibly I would go for I'd probably go for this one because it's not necessarily the easiest read, but it does have, I think, just about everything. So it's Robert Hutchinson on Thomas Cromwell. When it comes to Francis Walking, Walsingham, I would almost certainly go for Derek Wilson's one. 
Sir Francis Walsingham, a courtier in an age of terror. And that was quite nicely written. But the books I find most generally useful are the strange ones, the ones such as the missing, the lost rivers of London, the ones such as um, the prisons of London. And you can also find books like this, The Annals of London. Now this isn't directly Renaissance only, it's not just about Bloody Mary and Elizabeth, but what it has is a vast amount of information about different years going through each of the years and bringing out the interesting things that happened that at that time. So, for example, when I was writing Rebellion's Message, I was referring to this all the time purely because it gave me a flavour for what people would have been talking about at that point in history. So, really, the whole point of this little chat is to say you you will find unbelievable amounts of information about that period. There's so many books about Elizabeth and Mary. But um, have a look around and try to focus in on what it is you're most interested in. But the difficulty that you've got is that you need to know about the landscape. So John Stowe, that's definitely um, very, very important. If you're going to write anything at all about London, that book is central. And try to get the best feel you can from that sort of thing. And then try to find out what it was like for real people. So that one essential. <clears throat> and then with luck, you should find all the gaps filled in. <laughs> That's all for now, I'm afraid. I must crack on with some writing. But thanks a lot for watching. I hope that was useful and I'll speak to you soon. Take care.